Hello and welcome to our first class, which uh, we will be looking at review of the function. And we will be covering accounting and finance, income statement, income and value, balance sheet, income and cash flow, statement of cash flow, and financial decision, and of course, summary conclusion. Here are our learning objectives. Oh, counting finance is about making a decision to produce value. And of course, it is important in making such decision to understand a firm's past and present financial position. So accounting usually provides such information. So information in accounting Usually organized in four financial stages income statement, statement of retained earnings, balance sheet, statement of cash flow. So, income statement in the simplest form is really just revenues less expenses, which equal to uh, net income. So, income statement um, measures profitability for a time period, say a year, six months even a three month period. So revenues are usually from customers for services or merchandise, but expenses are usually from vendors for merchandise services or supplies or could also be uh, say rent or amortization. So here we have an income statement, income statement of Kramer Corporation for the year ended December 31st, 20 exit. Now, in this income statement, is usually with a, uh, an accounting financial statement, it usually starts with a heading that tells you the name of the company, the type of statement, and for what year. So, in this case, uh, it's Kramer Corporation, it's an income statement, and it's for the year ended December 31st, 2018. So, it tells you for it's, it's an income statement for a year and it tells you when that year ended. Now, the first thing, first item on our income statement is usually sales. So, we have sales here for over that year, period of a year, will be $2 million. Then we take from that a cost of goods sold. Of goods sold, the cost of what it costs to produce if you're a manufacturing company or if you're a distributor, what's the cost to purchase those goods that have actually uh, just been sold? So, in a manufacturing environment, that would be uh, direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads that would be included in the cost of goods sold. Then, if we take our cost of goods sold from sales, we will have profit, gross profit of 500000 Next up is selling at administrative expenses. Selling would include, um, selling expenses could be like a salesman commission, for example, or advertising costs that could be included in there. And we have administration, administrative expenses, including items of um, running your office, for example. So we have next amortization, which is just another way of uh, looking at the depreciation. So I'm looking at depreciation. So when we take those two away from gross profit, we will have what's known as operating profit or earnings before interest. Right. So in this case, earnings before interest and taxes would be two hundred and thirty thousand. Now, from earnings before interest and taxes, we take interest expense. In this case, your interest expense would be twenty thousand. So this interest usually say interest being charged on a bond that a company has, so the company may uh, borrow from say uh, the public in a bond 
or it, it could be say a, a loan from uh, the bank so when we take that interest away we have earnings before taxes and in this case it would be two hundred and ten thousand dollars our taxes will be ninety nine nine hundred and uh, ninety nine thousand five hundred from which we will take away from earnings before taxes it would be earnings after taxes so our earnings after taxes one hundred and ten thousand five hundred so now we'll have to calculate our earnings per share so the first thing we'll do is to take away our preferred share dividend so our preferred share dividends are, are uh, in this case, we have two kinds of shareholders. We have preferred shareholders, and we have the common shareholders. So the preferred shareholders, are they are usually paid before, uh, they receive their dividend before uh, common uh, shareholders. And preferred shareholders is it's almost like a hybrid because it's like, like almost like a fixed amount of dividends that will be paid every year and it usually been taken out before paying our common shareholders. So the common shareholders are the shareholders that have the residual rights to the assets of the company and they would have voting rights and so on and it would be that the company will have to pay its preferred shareholders first before paying its common shareholders. So we'll take out the dividends that go to the preferred shareholders, which is in this case is 10,500. And so we're left with earnings available to common shareholders, which would be 100,000. So then to determine the earnings per share, we will divide the earnings available to common shareholders by the number of shares outstanding. So the number of common shares outstanding. And in this case, it's 100,000 shares that we have put on outstanding. And then by dividing this, uh, the, by dividing earnings available to common shareholders by um, the common by the number of shares outstanding, we produce earnings per share of one dollar. So let's look at what is called return and capital. So in this case, in our example, we have three kinds of we have creditors usually uh, say example say a bond and in our case it's a bond with an interest of 20,000 that will be paid every year until this bond is repaid so every year a company will will return will give to its bond holders interest payment then at the end of the period of when the bond uh, is due the company will repay the amount that is actually Borrowed. So let's say, for example, it's a 30 year bond. So every year for 30 years, the company will pay interest of $20,000. At the end of the 30 year, the company will return that how much it actually borrowed to the bondholders. Now, next we have preferred shareholders. And um, in our case, we, we said that the preferred shareholders' dividends was five. Is ten thousand five hundred in uh, uh, dividends, and of course, the common shareholders have a hundred thousand uh, earnings available that could actually be distributed to common shareholders um, uh, in the form of a dividend. What normally is a percentage of that that the company uh, will repay as dividends, or uh, the government, the company will pick a number, say. Say we will return, uh, we'll pay five percent, we'll pay five dollars per share. So the government, so the company will return, say, five dollars per share to each shareholder, or say, a dollar pending and 
it, it um, dividend policy. So our second statement is the statement of retained earnings. So the statement of retained earnings is the link between the income statement, which we have just looked at, and the balance sheet that we will look at. So again, the statement of retained earnings, it starts with that at the top, telling you what kind of statement it is, and or what figure. So the statement of routine earning will have a similar um, statement to that of the income statement for the year ended December 31st. So that would be exactly as it is in the income statement. So this statement would start with the retained earnings from the previous uh, period. And so that would be the opening uh, retained earnings. So on January 1, uh, the start of the year, it would be the opening retained earnings, or it would be the retained earnings on December 31st of the previous year. So that becomes our opening retained earnings on January 1 of the year that we are actually reviewing, which would be the year 20XX. Next, we're going to add earnings available to common shareholders, and in our case, it's 100,000, right? Next, we deduct cash dividends declared. So this would have been declared by the company that they will actually be paying to common shareholders as dividend. So once it's declared, it is removed from retained earnings. So retained earnings balance on December 31st of the year would now be 300,000. So remember first we we start out with the retained earnings carry forward and retained earnings from the previous year. In this case it is 250,000. To that, we will add earnings available to common shareholders, which is 100,000. And that comes from right here. See, we have earnings available to common shareholder of 100,000. Then the dividends that is declared to be paid to common shareholder was 50,000. So we will then subtract that from what we have above to, to have a retained earnings of 300,000. So that's a retained earnings balance. So, valuation basics from our income statement. The shareholder's claim and earnings is usually fundamental of value. Okay? The shareholder's claims and retained earnings is usually. So earnings per share is equal to earnings available to common shareholders over number of common shareholders outstanding. So EPS is equal to. 100,000 divided by 100,000 shares, which equals to $1. So, earning per share of Kramer's Corporation would be $1. So, what percentage of earning is paid out as a dividend? This would represent what? Payout ratio. So our dividend payout ratio which would be the percentage of earnings that is paid out immediately in dividend. So it would be the dividends per share divided by its earnings per share. Right? So the dividends per share divided by its earnings per share. In this case, the dividend per share was uh, 50 cents divided by our earnings per share, which was uh, $1. So 
So we determine an earnings per share payout ratio of 50% of 5 or 50%. So another form of valuation, shareholders' reliance and earnings will influence the price they are prepared to pay for shares of a firm. So we have what is known as the price earning ratio or just PE ratio. The price earning ratio is usually the market share price or the price at which a company is traded as trading for a publicly traded company divided by its earnings per share. So let's assume that in our case, uh, Kramer's uh, price, a uh, share price was $12. So we'll divide that by its earning per share of $1. And our PE ratio would be 12, 12 times. So here are the PE ratios of some selected uh, companies. Bell Canada, uh, Bank of Montreal, Lablas, Molson, Coors, uh, OpenTex, Encarta, and uh, the TX company, which is a Toronto Stock Exchange uh, company. So, another valuation is what percentage of earnings is paid out immediately in dividend, which would be the dividend yield. So, the dividend yield would be the dividends per share divided by the market price. So, in our case, the dividend yield would be uh, the dividend per share which was 50 cents divided by its market price of, of $12. So it tells you what the dividend yield is. So in terms of, um, so the, 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 the price of our, our, our the share price, uh, the valuation of our, our company's share is usually based on its Dividend yield as well as its capital yield, so its capital gain yield. So its capital gain would yield would be the price. So let's say you purchase it, the stock at twelve dollars, and then it moved up by one dollar. So you could calculate the dividend yield by finding that a, a percentage change from twelve dollars to twelve from one eleven dollars to twelve dollars. That will give you its capital gain. Yield. Now, its dividend yield will be based on the amount of dividend um, uh, you receive based on uh, this um, market share price. So, in this case, the dividend yield would be 4.17%. Uh, now, with the income statement, there are some uh, limitations. Income statement record past event. So collects historic data, which are irrelevant for valuation purposes. So relevant for valuation purposes because you're trying to determine the value of the company uh, based on its future potential, its ability to earn income in the future. While the income statement looks at past events. It looks at um, how has a company performed up to a particular uh, Accountants focus on income, while financial man, um, managers and analysts are interested in valuing the company. So financial manager and his um, objective is to really determine the value of this company here, while the accountant is really focusing on what, how much income was earned for a particular time period. And this um, income will be based on transactions that have taken place over the period. Accountants have some flexibility in reporting transactions and resulting income. So 
generally in, in different companies, uh, the company will determine, will make assumption, uh, assumptions and have different kind of uh, accounting policies. So for example, um, how does the company value its 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 uh, inventory? Uh, does the company uses first in first out valuation, or does it use its uh, a last in first out valuation? So just by using different valuation, it could uh, you could have a different um, in anal analyzing uh, a company, you would have different results. So therefore, you have to be aware of what kind of accounting policy the company adapts. And this is usually found in the in the notes to the financial statement of uh, the company. What kind of valuation is the company using? So you can determine how to uh, it, it, how to analyze this company based on statements. So let's take a look at balance sheet. The balance sheet, which is a statement of financial position, is a snapshot, a snap picture, snapshot that indicates the firm's holdings, right, which is what the firm's own obligations, yeah? Financing as liabilities are equity, which is um, ownership interest, and a measure of its value of a point in time. So we remember the income statement, it's usually say over a period of time, say from a year. So it's January 1 to December 31st. So they join the income over that period. But the balance sheet, it's it's looked, looking at the company's um, assets and its liabilities at a particular uh, point in time. So let's say as at December 31st. So let's look at the classification and the balance sheet. So <clears throat> First of all, we have assets, what is, which is what a business owns. Now, those assets could be uh, classified as current assets or capital assets. Now, current assets are example of current assets are like accounts receivable inventory, and these current assets are assets that will be sold or used within a year. So if these assets are expected to be sold or used within a year, they are generally classified as current assets. As against capital assets are long-term assets, which um, are usually um, assets that the company is expected to have over more than one accounting period, over more than one year. So this would be like buildings or uh, equipment. <clears throat> so liabilities are what a business owes. So again, we have, we could uh, classify liabilities as current liabilities or long-term liabilities. So current liabilities are, example of those would be like accounts payable, uh, which is what the company owes for goods that is actually purchased. So goods that are purchased are uh, for resale, uh, are materials that are purchased for resale uh, that, that are usually classified as accounts payable. And those are usually due in a year, so uh, it's, it's current liability. Current liabilities are usually liabilities that are due within one year. Long-term liabilities are due after one year. So uh, what if it's a liability that will be due in, uh, after a year, it's considered a long-term liability. Now, equity 
is what the owners have invested in the business right so if you start your company you start with say ten thousand that would represent the equity so uh, it's shareholders equity we have um capital stock and earnings and retained earnings so the capital stock that you invested in the company all right capital stock that you invested in the company let's say we start with say ten thousand then the company started earning and as the company started earning it retained some of that earnings it didn't distribute it as income as as dividend but it retained some of that earnings and those would be considered to be shareholders equity so assets are listed in order of liquidity so that's a general way um, assets are listed in normally in, in uh, using yeah. so in the balance sheet we usually have um, the asset listed at uh, in order of uh, liquidity and of course um, this is usually if we are using gap or we're using um, the, the way that private enterprises report mm -hmm. their balance sheet of course most public companies are now adopting what's called ifrs international financial reporting standard and using the international reporting standard um, there's a different way of listing their assets but we are going to look at assets that have been listed in order of liquidity so we have um, marketable securities would be, for example, if we're looking at our current assets, marketable securities, accounts receivables, less the allowances for bad debt, um, inventory, valued at cost, and paid expenses. So long term assets, so longer term assets uh, will be, for example, investment, health longer than marketable security so it's held for a longer period of time it's it's it, there's no so marketable securities are usually securities that are expected to be converted in a pretty uh, short period while investments are usually held for much longer um it could be for two years or as what as much as longer than a year so it's not looking to have a uh, to be sold within a year. So plant and equipment plus accumulated amortization. So here is Kramer's balance sheet. And again, we started we start at the top with uh, uh, Kramer Corporation. And we, it, it, it said what kind of statement it is. It's a balance sheet. And it says that it's December 31st, 20. So, as at December 31st, this is where the company stands in terms of its assets and its liabilities. So, as at December 31st, this is where it stands. Come January 1, the next year, it may completely change. But at December 31st, this is where the company stands in terms of its assets and its liabilities. So. You can see we start with cash because cash is usually the most liquid. Then we have um, marketable uh, securities. And next we have accounts receivables, which we would take our allowances, uh, allowance for bad debt. So we can um, have uh, accounts receivable net of bad debt, inventory which would be based on whether we are using uh, first in, first out, last in, first out, uh, weighted average cost of valuation in here. So in analyzing inventory, for example, you would have to know what kind of valuation uh, the company is using. So prepaid expenses, 
and in our case prepaid expenses is going to be thousand. So total current asset will be four hundred and fifty thousand. So other assets we have would be here investment fifty thousand. Then we have our capital assets, which would be plant and equipment original at original cost. Of course, if we're using IFRS, it would be listed uh, at a at appraised value, but we're not using IFRS. So it's listed at its historic and our original cost. And then from that original cost, we will take the accumulated amortization to determine the net plant and equipment. In our case, net plant and equipment, 500,000. Total assets, 1 million. Okay. So now, now we could look at liabilities and shareholders. So that's the second part of our balance sheet. So we start with current liabilities. We have accounts payable, which is what we owed to suppliers of and services that are used for research. Notes payable, um, and as it says here, is bank indebtedness. So it's uh, an amount that is outstanding to the bank and could be paid for within the current, um, within a year. So it's listed as current liability. We have accrued expenses, and we have total current liabilities of hundred and ten thousand. Then we have long term liabilities, which is bonds payable at in twenty thirty. So in twenty thirty bond is due to be paid. So in twenty thirty the company will return ninety thousand dollars to its bondholder. But before twenty thirty it will be paying interest on the bond. So you remember we had interest being paid and that was the interest that's actually being paid on the bond. So we have total liabilities of thirty thousand. Total liabilities right of thirty thousand. We have long term liability of ninety of three hundred thousand, sorry. We have long term liability of 90,000 and we have current liabilities of 200,000. So, total liabilities would be 300,000. So, shareholders' equity would be <coughs> preferred stock. We have 500 shares of preferred stock. Right? That's was um, issued for $50,000. Then we have common stock that was for $350,000. There's 100,000 shares. And then we have earnings per share of $300,000. So total shareholders' equity would be $700,000. And so Liabilities and shareholders is one million dollars. So you can see that our total assets here of one million, right, is equal to is equal to our total debts or total liabilities of three hundred thousand plus total shareholders equity of 700,000. So you can see, you can see that so in that case, the accounting equation would be total assets equals total debt plus 
their holders equity so again the accounting equation would be total assets equal to total debt plus their holders equity So balance sheet liabilities. So current liabilities are short-term obligation due within one year. For example, comes payable, notes payable, paid expenses. Long-term liabilities are obligation due more than one year. For example, a bond payable. So let's look at some valuation from the bonds. So one number related to a firm value and the balance sheet, the net, worth are, the net worth are the book value, which is defined as shareholders' equity minus preferred shares. Right? So the book value would be shareholders' equity minus preferred uh, So it represents a common shareholder's original investment plus all earnings reinvested. So that's a retained earning in the firm uh, so far. So another valuation would be analysts often calculate the relationship between the value per share and historic value per share. So that's a market value versus the Book value. So the market value right, right, divides by its book value. Market value per share over a book value per share. Uh, that's another way that the company is usually is how much does um, the, the market value changes? Is it increasing relative to what uh, the, the book value is? Um, so let's say this company uh, is around for a while. You can tell it's it generating value based on its market price relative to what is book value. So the comparison of market value to book value per share due to 2017. And we can see those companies that we looked at before, some of them here. And you can see their market value per share versus their book value uh, per share. And generally, you would expect the market value to be higher than uh, the, the book value per share. So what are the limitations of the balance? Values are stated on a historical or not as basis for private companies. But companies must report using IFRS market value. So if the company was reporting using IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standard, then you'd use the appraised value or the market value for its assets. If you're using um, GAAP or we're using a private enterprise reporting standard, then it would be um, at historic. Are original. Content policies and methods used, uh, example, amortization or inventory valuation will influence recorded value. So you have to be aware of what is the amortization, uh, for example, that's been used, amortization policy or the, the inventory valuation method that is being used. So these are what you would get from your your financial statement and notes to the financial statement and um, any other assumption that the company is making. So you look at different accounting policies. And if these accounting policies actually change, then the company would have to state that it's changed. And of course, you would reinstate those, um, those previous year using the new accounting policy so that uh, a proper comparison. So contingent liabilities, which are liabilities that a company may face in the future, for example, some losses, and uh, these are generally omitted. 
from the balance sheet. So in common cash flow, so a profitable firm does not necessarily generate high cash from probably high cash probably because it sells and credit. So company do, may not necessarily generate cash even though it's reporting profit, right? Because it may sell on credit. So while from a finance uh, perspective, cash is what is important. So for all accounting, attempts to match revenues and expenses, so even if the related cash flow occur at quite a different time. So because um, accounting generally is based on using the accrual uh, concept or the accrual accounting, um, methods. It means that when the sale is made, that's when it's recorded as um, revenue, uh, not necessarily when that cash is received, right? So financial managers, on the other hand, are only concerned with cash flow because only cash can be spent. Right? So, so financial managers are more um, interested in cash that can be generated so the statement of cash flow uh, report changes in cash equivalent resulting from activities of the firm in a given period so in the statement of cash flow is what where we would look at how cash has been how is the company using cash where is the core the company's sources of cash so all these questions will be answered in the statement of cash flow so the statement of cash flow measures the flow of cash in and out of the firm. So we have cash flow from operating activities. We also have cash flow from financing activities. So, so operating activities would be in the normal courses of operation of uh, buying and selling goods, of paying its bills, it's staff, it's um it's rent and so on. These are cash flow activities from operate from upper cash flow from operating activities. Cash flow from financing activities would be cash flow that result from uh, uh the company um financing it's it's right for example company issuing a bond or company doing new uh or the company uh, right as in cash flow from investing activities would involve a company making investment in plants and equipment or long term, other long term investment. So, in looking at a cash flow, you can see here that cash we have on the left hand side, we have cash inflow, and on the, out, on the right hand side, we have cash outflow. So, the generation of funds in normal operation right which is cash flow from operating activities and while cash outflow will be expenditure of funds in normal operation right? so what about cash flow from investing activities so cash flow from investment activity with the sale of a plant or equipment or liquidation of long-term investment so that would mean cash inflow while cash outflow in investing activities would be like Purchase of a plan and equipment or long term investments. So any form of long term investment or plant and equipment um, that is for a purchase would uh, consider cash outflow from investing activities. Cash flow from financing activities would be the sale of bonds, common stock, preferred stock, and other securities. While Cash outflow would be re retirement or repurchase of bonds. So if a company 
uh, retire its bond by paying back its, its bondholders, uh, repurchase its bond. Again, that involves repaying its bondholders. Common stock um, uh, by retiring of such common stock or retiring of preferred dividends, uh, repurchasing of, of common stock or uh, not retiring, but repurchasing of common stock. So, um, uh, these will consider cash outflow of from investing from financing activities as well as payments of the dividends as well. So in putting all these together, we can determine the net increase or decrease in, in cash. So sources are use of cash. So operations. So cash paid and received from buying and selling of goods. The source are the use of cash in operation is cash paid and received from buying and selling of goods and services. <coughs> Investing investment is cash paid and received from investment activities, bond, stock. Well, financing would be cash paid and received from financing activities like dividend, borrowing, or issuing stock, or issuing stock. So, what are the steps in, in computing cash provided by operation activities? We're using the indirect uh, method. So, in the indirect method, we're going to do that. Start with net income. And we're going to add the net income, amortization, and or other non-cash items. So the reason why we are doing that is because our interests are in cash. Now, as far as amortization is concerned, it doesn't involve the movement of cash. Amortization is the depreciation of, say, plants and equipment. Now, this plant and equipment may have purchased a while back. So let's say it was purchased two years ago. Every year, a portion of this would be written off uh, as, as the equipment depreciates in value. So this depreciation in value is what would be um, considered to be amortization. Each year would pass a portion of that through our income state. Because the assumption here is that the the plant and equipment is not useful in only one accounting period, but in many accounting periods. Hence, the cost of using that plant and equipment should be spread over a number of accounting periods. So, it, the company would spread the cost of that plant and equipment over a number of accounting periods by depreciating it every year uh, up until when it's actually uh, reaches the end of its useful life or when it is sold. Because this amortization doesn't involve cash, it therefore it has to be added to the net income. So the, we start with net income, then we're going to add back the amortization amount to net income. Right? Then what we have next is Increase in current assets, right? So any increase in current asset that would be deducted. Any decrease in current assets would be added. Increase in current liabilities would be added, and decreases in current liabilities would be deducted, right? And then that would provide what is called cash provided, uh, that would produce what's called cash provided by operating of activities. So here is our balance sheet for the year 20XX and the previous year 20 uh, w so this balance sheet is using um, accounting standard for private enterprise or it's using GAAP. So that's not produced using 
IFRS is produced using content standard for private enterprises or GAP, a general, generally accepted accounting principle. So we have two periods being reported here. The balance sheet as at December 20x, which is the year that we are for, we have been focused now, and we have the balance sheet for the previous year, which is reported as 20x and double. So, what does this allow us to do? It allows us to make comparison as as we go along to changes in in um, items that we are expected to encounter for our uh, cash flow statement. So let's start with operating actor. So we said we're going to start off with our net income, which, if you remember, net income was 110,000 back in the office. Then you can also look in our income statement because we're getting this information here from our income statement. And you can go again and look to see that our monetization was 50,000. So that will be added. So we have cash flow from operation of 160,000. Now we have changes in non-cash working capital. So this non-cash working capital here is with information that we would get from our in balance sheet. So we are going to get those information from non-cash changes in non-cash working capital. So we have accounts receivable inventory, prepaid expenses, accounts payable, and um, decrease in accrued expenses. So these are all from our balance sheet. So let's start with increase in accounts receivable. So remember what we said, um, on assets, and it's an increase in current assets, then it will be deducted. Increase in, in current assets which will be added. So, consistible, consistible increase. Right? So, consistible increase from 170 to 200 and to 200,000. So, there's a $30,000 increase in consistible. So therefore, that 30000 will be deducted because it was an increase. If it was a decrease, we would have actually added it, but because it's an increase, we are deducting it. And the idea here behind this is that if I move from $170,000 in accounts receivable and I go up to $200,000, it means I am missing out on cash, right? So it's almost like and getting less cash from moving from 170 to 200. Therefore, it is almost seen as like a cash outflow rather than a cash inflow. Hence, it is deducted. So, next one is increase in inventory. So, increase in inventory. Look again, inventory increased from 160 to 180. And it follows the same principle because it's an asset. So if it increases, then we are going to deduct. So we have to make a deduction of 20,000. And where we are where at it here, we can look at the prepaid expenses. We see that prepaid expenses has been reduced. Therefore, we are going to add 10,000 for changes in prepaid expenses. And we are going to deduct twenty thousand dollars for changes in expenses. So let's see if that's what we're doing. So you can see we're adding twenty thousand for increasing prepaid expenses and decreasing in sorry twenty thousand for increasing inventory, and we are adding ten thousand for the decrease in the prepaid expenses. Let's continue with our working capital. So, um, 
in terms of the working capital. So working capital would be actually our current assets and our current liabilities. So now we have to go down to the liability section. So the first one that we have would be an increase in accounts payable. So an increase in accounts payable it means that we are making less payment for our accounts payable or liability. We're making less payment, which means that we're able to keep up more cash. So if we're more able to keep up more cash, it means that we should be doing what? We should, if it's increased, like in this case, then we should be adding. So we should be adding this increase in accounts receivable. So increase in accounts receivable of 35,000 will be added and decrease in accrued expenses will be subtracted. So you can see that with our, so you can see that with our accrued expenses that is actually have been uh, reduced. So it's like we, we have to make an old payment for it to be reduced from this year to this year to 30,000. So hence, there we are going to subtract 5,000 as you can see. So we're going to sum all of these and we have net cash, net change in non-cash working capital to be 10,000. And to that we will add our 160, 1500 to give us a cash provided by operating activities of 150,500. How about cash flow from investing activities? So, the company um, may purchase some equipment or it may make sale on its equipment, right? So, we're going to look at what happened we have uh, to our investing activities. So let's go back and look at our balance sheet. So you can see that our long-term equipment, our long-term investment here changes from 20,000 to 50,000, right? So the company increases its long-term investment, right? So it goes out and it makes purchases of more long-term investment. Therefore, there's a cash outflow of $30,000, right? Then we have plant and equipment. So plant and equipment also increases by hundred thousand dollars so you can see that last previous year it has a balance of one million now it has a balance of 1.1 million so it must have made um, purchase statement for a hundred thousand so there would be cash outflow of a hundred thousand and that cash outflow will be represented by a negative amount. So you can see cash outflow, which is a negative amount, that's how we represent it represented, with 30000 for that increase in long-term investment and $100,000 for the increase in equipment. So cash used in investing activities would be $130,000. So how about cash flow from financing activities? So cash flow from financing activities would be we have um, bond increase. So let's cash flow from financing activities. We have there's no change in preferred stock. Well, let's start here. So let's start with long-term liabilities. So we have bond changed from 
40,000 to 90,000. There's an increase of 50,000 bonds. This suggested that, uh, that the company actually issued new bonds. Now, because the company issued new bonds, it means that there will be a cash inflow. So in issuing the bonds, it means that persons will purchase the bonds from the company, which means there will be a cash inflow. There will be a cash inflow of 50,000, which is the difference between 90,000 and 40,000 dollars. Let's take a look to see the aspect of this. So you can see that there's an increase in bonds of 50,000, so a positive $50,000. Again, we take a look to see what else do we have here. Right? So now we, we need to go to our retained earning account to get other information for retained earning account and our income statement. So we know in our income statement that we make a payment to dividends of 10,500. And we also know that we make dividends payment of fifty thousand dollars to common shareholders these both because they are cash outflow again we record them as negative so hence we have cash use in financing activities of this amount of negative fifty thousand negative ten thousand five hundred so it's an outflow of ten thousand five hundred that's a net amount so now we put all of these together to produce our cash. So this Cremus Corporation statement of cash flow for the year ended uh, December 31st, 2020. So again, you notice how it is recorded. Okay, so we now put all these that we have just done, operating activities, and remember, that we form this number cash provided by uh, operating activities. Then we have investing activities in which we found about 130,000. And we have cash used in financing act uh, activities, which is 10,500. So we have a net increase or decrease in cash during the year of so when we sum all of this up. 10,000, so we sum all these to uh, determine a net increase um, of 10,000. And remember, our cash at the beginning of the year was 30,000, so therefore, our cash at the end of the year is 40,000. So how do we check this? Make sure that they are correct. So this we can get from our balance sheet these two numbers. Let's check to see uh, what these two numbers are in our balance sheet. So if we go back to a balance sheet, we can see that the cash at the end of 20XW was 30,000, which would represent the cash at the beginning of 20XX. So we know the cash at the beginning of 20XX, which would be, say, January 1, 20xx would be the same cash at December 31st, 20xw. Right? So this would be the cash at the beginning of the year, 20xx, and the cash at the end of the year would be $40,000. So we see that those are indeed the same numbers. Let's look at the comparison of counting and cash flow. In year one, we have, so you can see in the first column, column number one, accounting. In the second year, in the column number two is the cash flow. So 
can see in both cases, you would have earnings before amortization and taxes would be a thousand, a hundred thousand, or a million. And we have amortization of 100. Uh, let's just keep it as a thousand and see. Right? So we have 100 in both cases. And we have earnings before taxes. That would be 900. And if we take taxes, we would have earnings after taxes in both cases to be 500. Now, with the cash flow, we have, we have to make more adjustments because the plant and equipment purchase will have to remove that cash flow. So that cash would be taken out. So we purchased um, an equipment for 500. And then we would add back our amortization because there was no outflow of cash with regards to the amortization. So therefore, our cash flow at the end year would be 100. Let's compare that with year two. In year two, we have a similar sales, similar amortization, similar taxes. And so we have earnings after taxes of 500 again. In this year, now we have cash. We'll have again, there'll be no equipment or flow of cash for within the purchase equipment, but there's still the amortization that needs to be added back. So you notice uh, the cash flow of 600, while the earnings would be 500. So free cash flow. Free cash flow can be calculated as a cash flow from operating activities minus a capital expenditure required to maintain the productive capacity of the firm minus the dividend needed to maintain the necessary payout on the common stock and to cover the preferred stock obligation. So after these are taken out, we can determine the free cash flow. The free cash flow represents the available for special financing activities like leverage buyout, uh, share buyback, mergers, and acquisitions. The free cash flow is reviewed to determine if there are sufficient excess funds to pay back the loan associated with a leverage buyout. So income tax consideration, income tax affect financial decisions. Corporate taxes vary by province and by type of business and size of business. So cash flow after tax are most relevant for a decision uh, making. So we can have a look at the cash flow that comes after we have taken out cover taxes. So after tax investment income, Paid to shareholders or other individuals varies depending upon the form of income. And expenses deductible from taxable income provides a tax shield for tax savings. So here's an example of a corporation. Corporation A pays $100,000 in interest payment, and Corporation B has no interest payment. So because taxes because the, the interest payment is tax deductible, you can see here in corporate A that they have interest of, of four oh, hundred thousand that would be taken out. And before taxes is calculated, so that no taxes is calculated, you can see paying far less taxes than in the case of corporate B, and that the difference in earnings uh, between the two is only $60,000, even though the interest payment was $100,000. Uh, and that's because of the tax shield that is, uh, is, is provided by um, the So, 
amortization and capital allowance as a tax year. So uh, amortization is again depreciation of equipment. Capital cost allowance is pretty much um, can be considered to be amortization. However, it's amortization from the government's point of view. So in, in other words, the government doesn't apply the amortization rule that companies will apply. The government will determine how much is it that will be paid on particular equipment. That could be not paid, but that could be used as, as um, to reduce your taxes as part of that amortization. And that is what is called capital cost alone. So the government will allow you to pass on some of that uh, cost of that equipment but it uses what is called capital cost allowance. And of course, you'll have uh, tables that will show you that what are the capital cost allowance that can be taken on different um, things. Example of two coverage and corporation A, it looks $100,000 in amortization and corporation B does not claim any capital cost allowance. Kind of using um, amortization and capital cost loans interchangeable, but in, in truth and in fact, they are different in that the capital cost allowance is what the government uses, while amortization usually was determined by the company. So, earnings before capital costs and taxes, as you can see here, is 400,000 for property A that has um, capital cost allowance. And for a corporate B, there is none. So the earning before taxes and income gain is reduced. And because, again, of being able to reduce your, your the cost, the capital cost allowance is able to reduce the amount that is paid on taxes. So you can see that in corporate A, it's paying $120,000 or $40,000 less than what corporate B is actually paying in taxes. The earnings after taxes is just comes down to 180 for corporate A, 240 for corporate B. So amortization is also deducted without cash flow. So we then added back this and you can see that based on that, because there's no cash outflow associated with this, you can see that corporate A has 40,000 higher cash flow than corporate B. And that's because it's able to, to, to pass on this capital cost allowance, which allows you to take advantage. So in summary, financial statement provides financial managers with information about the firm's profit, assets, liabilities, equity, and cash flow. Financial managers should be aware of the limitation of financial statements. Right? What are the assumptions that are made? What is it that can you can information you can use it for? The financial manager should be focused on cash flow and only cash can be spent. The statement of cash flow gives a rough picture of operating cash flow and the nature of the firm's investment and financing activities. Tax affects individuals and corporate financing. Okay. Thank you very much. So I see you in class on Monday.